that's flowing through. I have some charge that flows by. The rate at which that charge flows by is my current. So we define current as basically dq dt, or on more macroscopic average current, delta q over delta t. However, this is change in time, just the like delta is always meant, but that delta Q does not mean change in charge. So that's a, it's a little bit misleading because if I have current flowing at a regular pace, like basically if I ever took a snapshot, I have the same amount of charge in that spot as I do any other time. So this delta Q here is more of a reference to the mobile charge that passes by a point within a certain time. Within the time delta t. Now, oftentimes I'll just instead of writing delta t, I'll just write t using the sloppy physics notation that delta t is t final minus t initial because that's what delta always that's what change is. If I always start the stopwatch, if I always make the initial time zero, then my change in time is just whatever my final time is, which is what we generally call time. And so. I have no problem personally with it when I'm dealing with time to do this. I do have a problem with it in other cases, but by the same logic, some textbooks will do delta V equals V, or delta X is equal to X, using the exact same logic. Uh, I prefer not to use it in these other cases, presumably from some childhood scars. Which is my catch all for any time I do something that's contradictory. Now I said mobile charge because ultimately currents travel by, well, charge that happens to move. I, I'm not concerned with how much charge is there. I'm concerned with how much charge actually moves. So if we do a blow up of this, so I'm looking at a section of wire here. And I'm thinking about the electrons flowing through it. So if I've got, say, high potential here, and the low, lower potential on this side, which would potentially correspond to if I ultimately connected to a battery like that. I have electrons that are flowing, and as the electron flows, well, the electron's cruising along, and it's gonna hit something. This is not superconductivity here. It's not that the electron just sort of passes through everything else. The electron hits something and bounces, and hits something else, and bounces, and hits something, and bounces, hits, hits. The electron actually is not moving in a straight line, but is zigzagging and generally drifting in the direction that the electrons flow, opposite current flow. Re-emphasizing that, that we have current flowing this way, the electrons flowing that way. But we have the electrons flowing that way in at what we're calling the drift speed. If there's no voltage, if there's nothing hooked up to the battery, then the electrons might still be moving around, but their drift speed should statistically come out to be about zero. But once I add the battery, I now have this drive that's gonna make the electrons and they tend to move opposite the direction of current flow. I'm gonna let capital N equal the number of mobile charge carriers that are passing through. Delta X is this distance from here to here. That is just how far the electrons on average will, will actually travel in the time T. In other words, it's just the drift speed times our time delta T. 
I'm going to let the cross-sectional area of the wire be A. And so my volume of the section that I'm looking at here is just A times delta X. So this one does. Now ultimately, the formula I'm going to go for is does not want to derive it for, well, I've got this section of wire of this length and so or this volume, so how many charge carriers are there? It's going to be looking more for the charge carrier density because if I have a particular material, I've got a specific charge carrier density. And so I'm going to find little n as just the charge carrier density, little charge carrier density, which is just the number of charge carriers per unit volume. Charge carrier density. So if I'm thinking about how much charge is passing through my, my section of wire here, well, that should be the amount of charge that's passing through that section of wire should be the number of charge mobile carriers, the actual number of charges, times whatever the charge is of each of those carriers. I am making the assumption right now that they all have the same charge. Ultimately, I'm gonna make the assumption that they're electrons, but for right now, I'm gonna keep it generic and I'll pull in the fact that we're dealing with electrons later on. Since N over V, capital N over V is little n, big N must be little n times the volume. So the charge carrier, mobile charge carrier density times the volume times Q. And the volume we know is A delta X. So that's N A delta X Q. So N became this, and then V became that. So now the current is just the, the number of charges passing through here divided by time. So my current is N A delta X Q divided by delta T. And lo and behold, delta x over delta t, that's just my drift speed. So my current is n a drift speed times q. So, so far, relatively generic. Let's bring in some of the stuff that we've actually learned. Questions up to here before we talk about drift speed in more detail. So I have this charge that's moving around and then generally traveling to the left in my drawing. I know that in between collisions, it must be experiencing some acceleration, otherwise it wouldn't be wanting to slowly drift in a particular direction. So there's some acceleration involved here. I know acceleration is force divided by the mass. And the reason why these are drifting is that they're hooked up to some power supply. I have some voltage with a high voltage and a low voltage. If I think about it in terms of sort of macroscopically, I've got some high voltage here. It's actually connected to a battery and a low voltage over here. And because I have a difference in potential, I have this potential difference. I have an electric field. There's an electric field going from the positive side to the negative side through the wire. So the voltage, ignoring the sign, is equal to that strength of that electric field times the length of the wire.
I know that the force for a particle, a particle in an electric field is equal to the charge times the electric field divided by mass for the acceleration. And my electric field is delta V over L. So my acceleration for the particles should be Q delta V over Lm. So whatever the charge is, ultimately charge of an electron, times the voltage divided by the length of the wire, and divided by the mass of the particle. So now let's take a look at I, if I can assume constant acceleration as this thing is bouncing around. So constant acceleration, again, between collisions. So if I think about it, an electron moves along, it hits something and sort of stops dead as it bounces backwards. If something bounces backwards, it has to have a velocity of zero there for a moment. Or if it glances off, it's just as likely to glance off going that way as it is to glance off going that way. If I think about my velocity, being my initial velocity plus acceleration times time. For those who have had me, one of the cake formulas. For those who haven't had me, one of the constant acceleration kinematic equations from chapter two of pretty much every physics textbook. On average, my initial velocity is going to be zero. I'm just as likely to go this way as that way. If it also if it hits things, it stops upon occasion. On average, this is zero. And so my velocity is just basically going to end up being acceleration times time on average, which is, well, I have only two vectors here. So let's just call that my drift speed is acceleration times time. And yes, I acknowledge a little bit of a hand wave there. And my acceleration, we saw, is going to be delta V or not. And so this becomes Q delta V over LM times, this time right here is not the same as the time we talked about before. This time right here is the time it's going before it hits something else. It's the time while it has constant acceleration. And the symbol that, is, that I've seen used usually is the tau. This is the mean free path time. Mean free path is, the, the free path is basically if, if you're traveling, if we were running from one end to the other, what is the average distance that we go before we hit something? That's the mean free path. Mean as an average. It's the average length that you go, this time it's, I'm just specifically talking about the time it takes on average before you hit, run into something. So now plugging into here, we have N A Q delta V over L M tau times Q. So the substitution just made is that my drift speed, so it's in parentheses there. Isn't this so much simpler than what we started with? It is, we're almost there. We are getting some place. Um, I'm now gonna rearrange this, and at the same time, I'm gonna, I'm now gonna do the substitution. We're talking about electrons here, and so, I have, I have Q times Q, so I got, my charge of the electron squared divided by the mass of the electron. So I'm going to start out with that. So this is my current. So I've taken care of the two Qs and the M times N tau. Now I'll explain in a moment why I'm breaking it up this way. Times A delta V. I think I got it all. Let's see. L. Oh, thank you. Think about the parts we have here. 
The charge of an electron, the mass of the electron are pretty well established. If you really get into, this would be the average mass of an electron. There is somewhat of a spread there beyond the scope of the course. But this, for what we are dealing with in classical physics, is a constant. N times tau, N is the mobile charge carrier density, and tau is the mean is the time that it will go between collisions, that is material specific. How closely are the particles packed together? How many, what type of material it is? How many electrons does it contribute to the electron C? This is material specific. So I'm gonna label this first one as constant. This one is material specific. A is the cross-sectional area of the wire. L is the length of the wire. So this is wire-specific. And this is the voltage that you apply it to. In other words, basically, what kind of battery do you look at to? So this is, I guess, circuit-specific. And now, we get into the actual simplification. The E squared over the mass of the electron, as we said before, is constant as far as we're concerned. This is material specific, and so they basically lump all that stuff together and call that conductivity, sigma. Yes, because we've run out of wires. It's called the conductivity. And that is equal to E squared N tau over M sub E. Do you want to know the conductivity of an aluminum wire? Well, you just go to the table, look for aluminum, and look it up. They also decided that, you know, we got the letters, let's use them again. So they said, let's take the reciprocal of that. E squared N tau over M sub E. And we'll call that the resistivity. Is that? It's a row. Yeah, sigma and rho were also used for density, so let's not confuse those. So my formula down there is now simplified into I is equal to 1 over rho, A over L delta V. And then they take it one step further and put it in a more traditional form of delta V, therefore, is equal to rho L over A times I. This is resistance. And we symbolize by the letter R. And so we now have derived this equation, if I make that substitution, is that the voltage is equal to the current times the resistance. This is Ohm's law. Or, this is Coulomb's law just disguised. It's buried at the heart of it. And this is probably the most useful equation, delta V equals IR, that we will use in the, this chapters 27 through 30 or whatever the, it is for the PC circuits. You wrote sigma equals that stuff, and then right below you have the same thing again. What, sorry? In the what? middle of the board, sigma equals E squared uh, N tau. Oh, oops, thank you very much. You were right. That's M E over E squared N tau. Thank you. Any other mistakes? Yes. All right. Uh, that ends another lovely evening together. I hope you all have a safe couple days. And for the test, that's all we're going to be doing on Thursday. So you'll have the 
three hours. Hopefully I can remember probably the best piece of advice of test writing I've ever gotten. It was from the assassin who, sell, who said the motto is one fewer. So when I think I have the right number of problems, I need to take one out. <laughs> because, uh, yeah, I really don't want to do the four and a half hour test anymore. And I'm sure you don't either. Yeah, is, is, there, is there a time limit because we're at the last end of the day? So the four and a half hours comes in at, at 10.30, my brain shutting down, and at 10.30 I go, uh, that, that's it. That's, yeah, I was just wondering if there was like, I needed 30 more minutes. Yeah, I, generally not a problem. It, it generally comes from 251, 252 students more than any of the groups I have. Well, the students, some of the students will stare at a problem for a half hour doing absolutely nothing but stare at a problem, hoping for divine inspiration. And it probably hits just enough to encourage it to have any more. But that, so I need to keep that in mind. And also the other piece of advice I need to remember is just because I know what the solution is doesn't mean that you will immediately see it also. The 15-part uh, multiple choice question I gave that Still one of my favorite questions, but I understand it's potentially a 45 minute exercise for students for one question. Great question, poorly executed, <laughs> put it that way. Which of the following units are units of time? That was the question. Oh. And shocking number of students missed the letter S. I guess they were oh, for seconds. So, yeah. <laughs> I think there was a certain amount of psychological trauma that hit during that. Yeah. I mean, the majority of these questions are in any of my classes. I can answer, like, homework and everything, but when you put a test in front of me, it's just like... Yeah, I test anxiety is a huge thing. Like, first year teaching, I had a student during the first test, this was a teacher in high school, a pre-calculus test, she runs out of the room 15 minutes into it. At the end of the semester, she was sitting all the way through, and I said, Sandra, at the beginning, you ran out of the test, but now you can handle it. What happened? She said, Mr. Fox, which is my title at the time, I just realized your tests are so ridiculously hard, it doesn't matter, matter if I panic or not. So I'd like to think I cured her of test anxiety. Um, well, I, I, I learned in 